Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 15, 2017 NFL predictions. Well, this week for the fanatic, uh, to say the very least, it was not a very good week at all in terms of any of my picks. Uh, against the spread, I won 500, so I'm thankful I was able to break even against the spread with that. And straight up, I had my first losing week, I think since week three of the season, where I finished seven and nine straight up. Uh, just so many close games or weird endings that nobody really expected that that really kind of messed up my picks. Um, so now overall for the year, I'm 102, 99, and six against the spread. And straight up, I am now 136 and 72. Those two percentages equal up to about 51% against the spread and 65% straight up. So. With three weeks to go, 70% out of the range and 55% out of the range. If I can hit 53, 50, 53, 54%, I'll take that against the spread and I'll shoot for about 68% straight up for the final three weeks. But with how last week went, I'm just happy that last week's over and we have a whole new set of games and a whole new set of picks to go off of. Um, but before I get into those picks, um, I do want to congratulate the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers and Philadelphia Eagles, who are both the number one seeds in their respective conferences, have clinched playoff first by winning the NFC East and the AFC North, respectively. Uh, though I do feel bad for a lot of Eagles fans because uh, MVP frontrunner quarterback Carson Wentz tore his ACL on Sunday afternoon in Los Angeles, and he is now out for the rest of the year, leaving uh, journeyman quarterback uh, back into a spot or he's very familiar with quarterback Nick Foles taking over for the rest of the year. I will say this to all Eagles fans. Nick Foles, with this team, can still contend for a Super Bowl. I don't know if they're going to win it, because you can't lose your quarterback as valuable as he is, especially with how, Car how well Carson Wentz was playing. But Nick Foles has proven, uh, in Kansas City and with Philadelphia, that in a good offensive system... He can play decent enough to, you know, keep the Eagles afloat. You have three final games against the Giants, um, the Giants, Raiders, and Cowboys. You can win very easily all three of those games to get to 14-2 and two and secure the number one seed. And with how loaded that team is around them, I think that's a good spot to be in to, to at least still fight. And the number two seed right now, the Vikings, is playing with Case Keenum, who had his... Uh, worst game in about a month. Though he still did okay. He threw about 280 yards, two TDs, and two interceptions. But if you have Nick Foles and Case Keenum, that's kind of pushing there with, with how both teams are. So the Eagles, you guys are going to be okay. Again, I don't know if you are locked to win the Super Bowl anymore or locked to get there, but you still can at least play decently. So I'll say that. And uh, for Pittsburgh, what a game. Third straight buzzer-beating kick. Or third straight... Game-winning field goal four in the last five games. But that's kind of the thing with the Steelers is that, you know, is any time, you know, they play down to their competition every single week, but at any time they can raise their play to beat anybody. And I, I think that they are the biggest challenge to the Patriots, and the Patriots may not look as effective because they just lost to the Dolphins uh, yes, last night, 27-20. Uh, to 20. Tom Brady's now 7-9 and nine in Miami. The only other place on the road where he has a losing record is Denver, Colorado. So if you play Tom Brady in Denver or you play Tom Brady in Miami, you actually have a decent chance to win the game. And it's actually more impressive in Miami because Miami really hasn't had anybody in the Brady era or a team that's been capable enough to beat them compared to the Broncos, which over the last couple of years have had Manning and uh, Manning and that defense uh, very talented. So, but we'll see about that. So I just wanted to say that quick shout out real quick. Before I get started into my picks. Um, Alright, so now time for my picks. So, this Thursday, when the 5, I'm sorry, when the 4 and 9 Denver Broncos go to the 3 and 10 Indianapolis Colts, the Denver Broncos are 2.5 point favorites in this game. I like Denver here, minus 2.5, and, and Denver straight up. And then on Saturday, when the 4 and 9 Chicago Bears go to the 7 and 6 Detroit Lions, the Detroit Lions are five-point favorites in this game. I like Chicago here, plus five, but I will take the Detroit Lions straight up. And then the next game, when the 7-6 Los Angeles Chargers 
go to the 7-6 Kansas City Chiefs. The LA Chargers are one point favorites in this game. I like the LA Chargers here, minus one, and the LA Chargers straight up. Then the next game, when the fought, I'm sorry, when the six and seven Miami Dolphins go to the seven and six Buffalo Bills, this is a pick 'em game against the spread. So I'm going to take Miami here against the spread, and Miami straight up. And then the next game, when the seven and six Green Bay Packers go to the nine and four Carolina Panthers. The Carolina Panthers are three-point favorites in this game. Uh, with the return of Aaron Rodgers, this is a risky play, but I'm going to trust Aaron Rodgers' ability now coming back with the motivation of still having a slight chance at the playoffs. I am going to take that and take Green Bay plus three here and Green Bay straight up. And then the next game, when the 7-6 Baltimore Ravens go to the 0-13 Cleveland Browns, the Baltimore Ravens are seven-point favorites in this game. I like Baltimore here, minus seven, and Baltimore straight up. Then the next game, when the 4-9 Houston Texans go to the 9-4 Jacksonville Jaguars, the Jacksonville Jaguars are 11.5 point favorites in this game. I like Houston here plus 11.5, but I'll take Jacksonville straight up. Then the next game, when the 5-8 Cincinnati Bengals go to the 10-3 Minnesota Vikings, the Minnesota Vikings are 11 point favorites in this game. I like Cincinnati here plus 11, but I'll take the Minnesota Vikings straight up. Then the next game, when the 9-4 New Orleans Saints Go to the 5-8 New York Jets. The New Orleans Saints are 16-point favorites in this game. But with Josh McCown breaking his hand and the Jets really not having a quality quarterback at all backing him up, I am going to eat the points and tell you guys to take New Orleans minus 16 and New Orleans straight up. Then the next game, when the 11-2 Philadelphia Eagles go to the 2-11 and 11 New York Giants, the Philadelphia Eagles are 7.5-point favorites in this game. I like Philadelphia here, minus 7.5, and, and Philadelphia is straight up. Then the next game, when the 6-7 and seven Arizona Cardinals go to the 5-8 and eight Washington Redskins, the Washington Redskins are 4.5-point favorites in this game. I like Washington here, minus 4.5, and, and Washington straight up. Then the next game, when the 9-4 and four LA Rams go to the 8-5 and five Seattle Seahawks, the Seattle Seahawks are 2-point favorites in this game. I like the LA Rams here for an upset. I'm going to take the LA Rams here, plus 2, and the LA Rams straight up. Then the next game, the game of the year in the AFC in my opinion, when the 10-3 and New England Patriots go to the 11-2 and Pittsburgh Steelers. This game is, from what I've seen on my website where I get my lines, is a pick em game. So I'm going to take the New England Patriots here against the spread and New England straight up. Then the next game, when the 8-5 and Tennessee Titans go to the 3-10 and San Francisco 49ers. The San Francisco 49ers are two point favorites in this game. I like the San Francisco, San Francisco 49ers here, minus two, and San Francisco straight up. And then the Sunday night game, when the 7-6 and six Dallas Cowboys go to the 6-7 and seven Oakland Raiders. The Dallas Cowboys are three-point favorites in this game. I like Dallas here, minus three, and Dallas straight up. And finally, on Monday Night Football, when the 9-4 Atlanta Falcons go to the... Uh, go to the 4-9, and nine, there we go, 9-4 and four Atlanta Falcons go to the 4-9 and nine Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Atlanta Falcons are six-point favorites in this game. I like Atlanta here, minus six, and Atlanta straight up. All right, so time for my thoughts on each game. Denver over Indianapolis. Um, this is one of those games that it's really not that entertaining. Personally, I wish they would flex this out of Thursday Night Football, but obviously with how the season started for Denver and Indy, you were thinking, okay, Andrew Luck could uh, would be in this game, and Denver would, after a 3-1 and one start, would not have lost. Eight of their last nine games. And also you would have Sidney playing better and them not having a quarterback. But I'm going to take Denver here because I trust this Denver defense and team to shut down the Colts offense. Uh, they had a they had a bit of a nice offensive explosion. They had 23 points. They had their first shutout in about 12 seasons, which also was against the Jets. And I just look at Denver, you have to gain some confidence in that. Thomas had one of his better games. They were able to run the ball effectively. McManus had an up and down game. But it also felt good that if the Jets offense, which has a little bit more talent, or well, besides T.Y. Hilton, has kind of comparable talent to the Indianapolis Colts offense right now, I have to trust that Denver's defense can pull this out. Would I be surprised if the Colts won this game? Not at all. The last time they played each other, in, the, in that stadium, the Colts were able to win the game. Andrew Luck's uh, 
last uh, big victory uh, for the 2015 season before he had his last rated kidney. But I'm just going to take Denver here because Jacoby Brissett, he's played okay. He could play decently. He could outplay Trevor Simeon. But Simeon has a much easier matchup with the Colts secondary and Colts defense compared to Simeon, uh, compared to Brissett, who has to go up against the Denver defense, which is still pretty talented and loaded uh, for this kind of matchup. You know, th this game really isn't entertaining. I'm going to watch it because I'm a the NFL fanatic and I just enjoy watching football. But I'm just going to dig Denver here. They have more talent around them. I, I gained some confidence that if they could shut out the Jets with Josh McCown out through the second half, and even when Josh McCown was playing, they, they, didn't, he did, they didn't play well. Um, he threw uh, two horrible interceptions, which cost, you know, cost them the momentum of the game. But with that, you know, with that, I didn't get Denver defense has some confidence. It's a short week, and I will take the talent over the Colts, who played in a horrible blizzard. And, uh, very 2001 Patriot Raider type of conditions. I do want to congratulate Frank Gore. He had a career high in carries at age 34 with 36 carries, but he did have 120 plus yards. So kudos to him for still playing that well. And uh, Vinatieri, that was kind of the difference. Uh, Vinatieri was able, he missed about a 32 yard field goal in the snow, and then he, he got the extra point to tie the game after it hooked all the way back out from the right to the left, and then he missed a 43 yarder at the end of the game uh, to, to win it. But I'm not really going to blame Vinatieri. He, he really had it. I think he was. They said that he was 11 to 21 from the Buffalo Stadium, and it was a blizzard. So any of those kickers, you really can't expect them to kick that well in those kind of conditions. So, but I'm going to take Denver here. Better defense, uh, more of a confidence building kind of mentality, and I'll take more talent over the Colts. The more talented team will win in this game, in a meaningless game. But I'm, and that's what the Broncos are. So that's why I like Denver here minus two and a half, and Denver straight up. Next game, the Lions over Chicago. I have to give the Chicago Bears a uh, good amount of credit. That was an impressive all-around game uh, on Sunday. They beat the brakes off the Bengals in a way I did not expect. You know, 33-7. to Mitchell Trubisky had his best game as a pro. He ran for a touchdown um, and 270 yards and threw for another touchdown. Jordan Howard became the first Bears rookie running back to rush for consecutive 1,000-yard seasons to start his career. Um, Kendall Wright had a decent game. Tariq Cohen was making more splash plays with the screens and and all that. And that Bears defense showed up. They got Andy Dalton the only, uh, you know, one TD and three picks. And I, I was really impressed. I thought that was a, you know, resounding victory for a team that nobody really thought had a chance against the Bengals team, which was just more talented. Um, and... And also, they scored over uh, 30 points for the first time since, I believe, week 15 of the 2015 season. So, good for Chicago there. Um, but the reason why I'm taking the Lions is because it's just kind of like the Lions-Bears game earlier this year. It was a competitive game between Stafford and Trubisky. You know, Stafford had more talent around them. You know, the running games, the Bears have a significant edge of running game. But I just think, again, the Lions showed you again. Even the Lions committed about two or three turnovers in the game against Tampa, they were able to find a way at the very end to put together a drive that got Prater a game-winning field goal and to escape with a victory in uh, Tampa. And I just feel like with the Bears and the Lions, it's kind of the same thing. Um, the Bears, you could argue, in that game earlier this year, if uh, Santos or if Connor Barf makes that field goal, it's a tie game, and maybe the Bears would have won that game. But just with being at home, seeing what the Lions have, I think Theo Riddick's been decent. You know, Golden Tate had a really nice game. He had a big touchdown. I just think, again, the Lions' defense will know how to control the Bears' offense and make them one-dimensional and stuff the run, forcing Trubisky to throw. And I'm going to trust the Lions' secondary to make enough plays to have Trubisky get stalled offensively, and the Lions can use their very passing game uh, to get to grind out a win against a uh, decent division rival, because the Bears are better than a four and they're better than a four and nine record. They've been in several games this year uh, where they could have won the game or at least have looked very competitive. Um, but I'm going to take the Lions here just because. With that being said, the Bears have been known to 
blow games at the end, and the Lions over the last couple of years have been able to find ways to win games at the end. And if you're going to tell me, if you take the team that's young, that's out of playoff contention, that's just playing through the motions, with a team that still has a slight chance to make the playoffs, I'm going to get slight chance uh, with Stafford at the helm, everything the Lions have offensively and defensively, to pull this one out at home. It's going to be a great game, and I, you know, wouldn't be that surprised if the Bears won, because the Bears played really well against the Lions, and I think the Bears, with the momentum of Cincinnati, will be playing more motivated. But give me the home field advantage, give me Stafford, and give me this Lions team that is more used to coming from behind, and a Bears team this year that's proven they know how to collapse more than to build off of their games. So that's why I like the uh, Bears plus five, but the Lions straight up. Next game, the Los Angeles Chargers over the Chiefs. This is a game where I am taking the L.A. Chargers momentum. This is a momentum game. The Chiefs over the last couple weeks have looked more effective. Alex Smith has thrown about five TDs and about, I think, one pick in his last two games. They've put up 60 points in the last two games, averaging 30 points a game under new offensive coordinator Matt Nagy. Um, the defense caused two or you know two to three huge turnovers, and Kareem Hunt had a 100-plus yard scrimmage game the first time in seven, eight weeks that that happened. So the Chiefs played like they did the first five weeks. That was the formula that created the opportunity for the Chiefs to roll victories. And they do have the advantage because they are at home. And they are coming off their first win in about... Uh, their first win in six weeks. But the reason why I'm taking the Chargers, and I know you guys could say, you know, wow, you're being so nice to the Chargers now. Well, I have a reason to be. Like, after the Chargers started 0-4, I called them the Chokers. Because that's what the Chargers had been doing for the last couple years. I've been choking several games away. They choked away definitely three of those four games to start the year. And then they, you know, win three games in a row, two of them by the skin of their teeth, but they blow out the they blow out the Broncos, get to three and four, and then lose their next two, and then win the next four. <laughs> so this is the thing about the Chargers, which is so compelling to me. Like, when you look at how the Chargers have played, they've been more consistent, more dominant, have more talent, have been able to, you know, roll through every single opponent by at least, you know, a touchdown or more in all, in all of their uh, big victories over the last, well, in, five, in their last five games, when at least by a touchdown. So, to me, I, I just have to keep rolling with that momentum. Like, the Chargers, I'm going to put faith that they've gone into Dallas and won a football game. They went into New York and won on this little run they've been going on. They, let's see, went into New York. They went into Oakland and won. And this is just a better team. And I, I think if the Chargers want to cap this comeback, because remember, through five weeks, the Chiefs were 5-0 and and the Chargers were 1-4. and I just think they have to show that they've been the better team. Because if you're looking at kind of the better, like this is a better team game. The Chiefs had the momentum early. The Chargers have had the momentum late. And you kind of can just look it up every day and go, well, the Chiefs can blow games, and the Chargers can blow games this year. The Chiefs are at home. And with all that being considered, I'm going with the talent in this one. The Chargers have been too good. They have too much talent, though, I think, out to uh, confuse Alex Smith in December. And I don't think Kareem Hunt's going to be able to get a lot of yards against this Charger run defense. And I think the Chargers, with the experience of Rivers, with the running back capability they have in Gordon, they have a more complete wide receiving core compared to the Chiefs, and their defense will shred through that offensive line of KC's. And I, I think the Chargers pull this out and complete the comeback and take over first place in the AFC West and basically guarantee and punch their ticket in the uh, playoffs with this victory. It's going to be a close game. It's going to be an exciting game. I would tell people... Out of all the prime time early before Sunday games, this is the one to be most intrigued about, the one to watch the most, and I'm going to take the Chargers here because of the talent and the momentum that they have. I've been more impressed by the Chargers over the last eight weeks compared to the Kansas City Chiefs, and that's what I'm going to go with now.
So that's why I like the LA Chargers here, minus one, and the LA Chargers straight up. Next game, the Dolphins over the Bills. Jay Cutler had his second biggest signature win of his career on Monday night. He threw for 268 yards, three TDs. He's now 12-7 and seven in Monday night football or Sunday night football primetime games, uh, which have been absolutely impressive. But I'm taking the Dolphins here. You might, you might call me a prisoner of the moment, but I'm taking the Dolphins here because they have a more qu qu complete team around them. They have Kenyon Drake, who's been running really well. They have uh, the other guy, uh, they number 46, who could, who's been decent. They have Landry. They have Parker. They have uh, Cutler, who's coming off a big game. And again, you could say, well, I'm betting on Jay Cutler. That's, you know, you could say, well, Jay Cutler can't play that well again. He probably won't this week, but he won't probably need it against either Tyrod Taylor, who's dealing with a knee injury, Nathan Peterman, who's in concussion protocol, or Joe Webb, their third string quarterback. <laughs> like, when you have those three guys as your options, and the New England Patriots could not run the ball at all last night, so I don't think LaShawn McCoy will get 130-plus yards on 25-plus carries, and if they can't get that, I don't trust this Bills offense to move on this Dolphins defense, especially with Xavier Howard, who's at five picks, in, or who's had four picks in the last uh, two games, uh, he'll probably be able to sh you know, contain Benjamin or Jones, and I, I think the Dolphins will be able to pull this game out. They just look more impressive. They have back-to-back -back wins, and I can't take the team that just beat New England to have such a letdown against this hobbled Bills team that they're going to blow it. So that's why I like Miami here and a pick them against the spread, and Miami straight up. The next game... Uh, Green Bay over the Panthers. This is this is a really tough game because the Packers. Look, I want to give Brent Hundley credit. Over the six week stretch, or yeah, over the eight week stretch that Aaron Rodgers could not play, he was able to pull out three wins, uh, and he was able to go three and five out of the uh, seven games, or three and four in that stretch. Um. And he was able to pull out the two wins that they needed, uh, the overtime win against Tampa and the overtime win against Cleveland um, to get them in the spot. And also, just a fun fact, somebody brought this, uh, I looked this up, Brent Hundley has more overtime wins in his career compared to Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is 1-7 in, in overtime games, Brent Hundley's 2 and up. That's a fact. Um, but I'm going to take the Packers here because I'm just going to believe in Aaron Rodgers. Um... The, the Panthers, they gritted out a very impressive victory. Um, they caused three huge turnovers. Case Keenum had thrown an interception in a month. He had thrown two to ice the game for the Viking, or for the Panthers. And Cam Newton, even though he had 135 yards, he was able to make big-time throws in key situations in the game to get them in scoring position. And he also had the big 62-yard quarterback scramble that got them the game-winning score. And also, congratulations to Jonathan Stewart. What a big 100-plus uh, yard rushing game with three touchdowns. Um, but I'm going to take the Packers here plus three because I'm going to believe Aaron Rodgers will be back this weekend. And Aaron Rodgers' ability, again with the Packers, just like we saw um, this year to start the year, will be able to elevate him and his team to a huge victory over the Panthers. But I'd be surprised if the Panthers won this game not at all. I think the Panthers have a better defense around them. This is Aaron Rodgers' first game back, and I don't know how much pressure and how much pain that shoulder can take when you have Luke Keekley, Lutulele, Thomas Davis, uh, Bradbury, uh, Mike Adams, and Kirk Coleman all going at you and, you know, hitting you in the shoulder. But at the end of the day, I just think, again, the Packers are motivated. They did this before. They were 4-6 and six last year. They were able to pull off six straight wins to get into the playoffs, win the North, and uh, make a deep playoff run. I don't know if they're going to make a deep playoff run, but they can start making a run with the return of number 12 Aaron Rodgers back to the lineup. And that much talent alone will be enough, is enough for me to take the Packers in an upset plus three against the Panthers. Should be a great game. But that Aaron Rodgers coming back, it's the jolt of offense that they need and the jolt of confidence that the Packers need to win this game. And I think they'll get it done. That's why I like Green Bay here, plus three, and Green Bay straight up. The next game, the Ravens over the Browns. All right, this is fairly easy. You know, the Cleveland Browns are 0-13. Uh, they're the first team in NFL history to start 
consecutive seasons 0-13. Uh, the way they lost on Sunday was one of the ultimate Browns-type losses where they're up 14 points on Brent Hundley and the Packers, and they they blow it. Uh, <laughs> and also, it was only the first time in Hugh Jackson's career that he had a double-digit lead in the second half of any game of his uh, short Browns tenure. But, you know, like, but that, like that's the problem. Like, when you look at the Browns, they need a they, they need a quarterback and they need just some confidence. And good luck to John Dorsey, who was hired by the Browns last week as the new general manager. Yes, he has a lot of capital and he wants another quarterback. So uh, by Deshaun Kaiser, you're just number now twenty eight, and number twenty nine is on his way. But I think the Browns needed to fire Hugh Jackson as well. Hugh Jackson is an awful head coach. He's going to be possibly one and thirty one as a head coach. How are you going to sit there if they go 0-16 and justify? And again, you could say, well, they're pulling the Sixers method. And to any of those people that believe in that, you know, crap, you know, I, I'm not one of those people. I just think that's nonsense. And losing on purpose to improve the team, that's not how you do things. You don't, you don't regress to the point of nothing and then rebuild that way. My idea of success is you build every single year. Hugh Jackson actually might regress from one win to zero wins. So, honestly, I, I I wish Hugh Jackson would have been fired. I think he deserves to be fired at the end of the year if they pull off this perfect winless season. And, you know, but we'll see. You know, but to go back to the game, sorry about that little diatribe by Hugh Jackson. I'm going to take the Ravens here because the Ravens that played decently against all the contending teams except one. Well, except one. Jacksonville. That was the only game where we looked like scrubs against the contending team. All the other games, you could say different circumstances. Maybe Jacksonville and the Pittsburgh home game. Okay, there you go. Jacksonville and Pittsburgh at home. Every other game, we've either won or looked competitive against contending playoff teams. You know, with the Browns, they're not good. You know, we, we still have one of the better defenses, and our offense over the last two weeks has put up uh, 83 points over the last two games, which is nuts. I don't know if, you know, we're not going to need, you know, 20 or, I don't think we're going to need 27 plus points to be the Browns. I think 20 to 23 will be enough. And we'll just do what the Ravens have done all year against below average teams. You know, if we get a 10, 13 point lead, which I expect, we'll be able to just drain the clock with Alec Collins, who's had one of the better years in the NFL. Definitely a surprise story. The former Seattle Seahawks running back. Um, but I am going to take um, the Baltimore uh, Ravens here just because, I just trust them. Like, this defense, you know, they're embarrassed to give up over 500 yards of offense to the Steeler offense and to blow a, you know, 11-point lead going into the fourth quarter, a 9-point lead with under seven minutes to go in the game. We're embarrassed, and we're going to take it out on the lowly Browns, and we don't want to have a repeat of 2007 where the Dolphins were going to go, were going to go in 16, and the only one they have was against the Ravens. That's the one thing I would, I would ask Harbaugh to do. Remind the Ravens of that 07 season. We don't want to be that one that prevented the perfect winless season. So that's why I like Baltimore minus 7 and Baltimore straight up. Next game, the Jaguars over Houston. This is one of those games where, again, week one, nobody knew what was going to happen. I didn't think Jacksonville was as good. Times have changed. Everything's flipped around. I, the only reason why I'm taking Houston against the spread is I like TJ Yates. Tom Savage, that was one. That was probably the big story of that game. Tom Savage gets knocked down. I think it was Buckner, and he's just laying on the ground. His hands are twitching. He's, his eyes are, open, are, are like wide open. He, he looks like he's having a seizure. And they they put him in the blue tent. He comes back out, but then about a couple plays later, they say, "No, you don't look good," and he's in the concussion protocol. Um, so they bring in T.J. Yates, who was a guy that I've always been a fan of. I like T.J. Yates. T.J. Yates is the guy that has two or three wins that he was able to finish for the Texans. And I think T.J. Yates, when you saw him come in the game, the offense actually looked more effective and moved the ball further. Um, but again, he's going up against one of the best defenses, if not the best defense in the NFL. Um, DeAndre Hopkins has, only, has been the brightest spot of that offense the entire year, having over 1,000 yards and about... Uh, 10 plus touchdowns almost at this point 
But that's why I'm taking the Texans plus 11.5. I believe TJ Yates enough that he can move this offense with Miller, with uh, Anderson, with Hopkins, uh, with Miller, with Fuller possibly coming back soon to keep this game within 10 points. Though I, I think Jacksonville should win because Jacksonville has been one of the ni- nicest surprises of the year. And this is an odd week for the Jags. And just like I've, I've said the entire year, when the Jags are at an odd week, they play extremely well and they tend to dominate the opponent. I think with what Houston has around them, I think Houston can just contend that enough. Would I be surprised if the Jags cover the 11-point spread? No. I just think that was too much with T.J. Yates at quarterback. And I'll give T.J. Yates his due, in my opinion, to uh, cover the 11.5 points. So that's why I like Houston here, plus 11.5, but Jackson a little straight up. Next game, the Vikings over the Bengals. The Bengals quit against the Bears. That was an incredibly disappointing performance. Nobody expected that. Um, and, again, maybe I, it's kind of the same thing with the Texans. Maybe I just have too much faith in the Bengals that they have enough talent that they're you know they're not going to want to get embarrassed, especially at, on the road against the Vikings team that's irritated that even through all the turnovers and mistakes they had, they, were still, they still had a chance to win the game. And if their defense doesn't give that 62-yard run, who knows what could happen. Um... And that could very well be the case. But it's kind of like with the Texans. I think the Bengals have enough talent to be able to cover the 11 points. Um, though I, I will say this. I do believe Marvin Lewis should be fired at the end of this year. It is time to do it. This is 15 years in the league. Um, and it's time. Just because you can't have a team with that much talent and not have non-losing or losing seasons for two straight years in your 14th, 15th year. And again, you can say, well, Pac-Man was out, Burford was out, Mixon was out. Sure, but there's just so many other things that go on, and you just can't have this kind of success to just keep accepting it. Honestly, in my opinion, the Bengals, if they keep Marvin Lewis, I I would really say that, that the NFL needs to investigate the Bengals on why they, they're keeping it. I have a thought that basically it's kind of like the reverse. Like, like basically for them, the Bengals want to keep Marvin because they just have too much faith in him. Or also, it's kind of just with the aspect of all the different coaches in the league that they don't want to fire him and have one less minority candidate with the Rooney rule in. I think that could be the other reason too. But at this point, that shouldn't matter. They didn't extend his contract beyond this year. And I, I think the Bengals need to pull the trigger at this move. Uh, you know, that's not about the Bengals, but to the Vikings' point, I think the Vikings should be able to bounce back. If the Bears can do that, the Vikings most certainly can. And I'm happy the Vikings are retaining Case Keenum for this week. Um, he played probably his worst game in about five or six weeks. And I think he'll be able to bounce back against the Bengals' defense, which is undermanned, uh, not really caring anymore. And I think it being back home, with where the Vikings have had an incredible home field advantage all year long, uh, Case Keenum will get back on the winning side of things this weekend uh, with a decisive win over the uh, Bengals. So that's why like Cincinnati are plus 11, but the Minnesota Vikings straight up. The next game, the Saints over the Jets. Um, the, the biggest reason why I took the Saints minus 16, you could say, well, wait, why are you taking the Texans plus 11.5 and, and the Bengals plus 11 where they're going against two teams with phenomenal defenses and better talent, and you're going with a bigger spread and taking the Saints against it, the the biggest reason why, Bryce Petty's starting. Bryce Petty is a scrub. He has not been able to do anything at all. The only thing I remember Bryce Petty ever uh, doing was getting squished by Cameron Wake and Adamican Sue. And you saw what happened. When he when McCown left the field, the, the, the Jets' offense died with it. And I think with the Saints, they're motivated. Their defense has played extremely well. They're going to get Alvin Kamara, their spark plug, back on offense. I think the Saints can go in there and absolutely obliterate Jets into, you know, a painful loss, which nobody's going to be surprised about with New York. I think the Saints have enough offensive firepower, the confidence in the drive, especially with the Falcons and Panthers right on their heels at 9-4, and four, to make a statement with the Jets saying, Atlanta, you got lucky this past Thursday. When you come into the Superdome, about two Sundays on Christmas Eve, it'll be a different story. (laughs) So that's why I like New Orleans here, minus 16, and New Orleans straight up. 
Next game, the Eagles over the Giants. The, the Eagles are just clearly the better team. And the Giants, through three quarters, they actually were pretty competitive with the Cowboys. It was 10-10. And then the fourth quarter comes around, and the Cowboys outscore them 20 to nothing in, in the last quarter. Eli Manning throws, you know, two horrible interceptions to end the game. Uh, the Giants' defense allows Rod Smith an 80-plus yard touchdown, and then Des Bryant a 50-yard touchdown. Dak Prescott throws for 300 yards. And this is just the Giants team that's just forgotten about this year and said, forget about the year and, and move on. Where the Eagles, you know, they're still fighting for the number one seed. I think Nick Foles, look, Nick Foles in his Eagles career, um, I think he only lost one time. Or he, he might not have ever lost to the Giants either. And maybe I'll have to look the game. Someone could mention in the comments if I'm right or wrong about that. But I don't think he's ever lost to the Giants. Um, and I just look at the Eagles and go, this is a team that with all the talent around them, they should maybe get Zach Ertz back. Um, they have Sidney Jones coming back to practice. This team should be able to cover a 7.5 point spread against this Giants team now, which has lost their head coach and has lost their firepower to finish the year. If they can lay a 20-point loss to the Cowboys... Feet, they definitely can lay a, at least over a seven and a half point loss against the Eagles. Sounds like Philadelphia minus seven and a half, and Philadelphia straight up. Next game, Washington over Arizona. This game was tough. Um, I'm gonna take Washington here just because of the quarterback. This is kind of like Jimmy Garoppolo, Tom Savage type of game. Like I said last last week, this is where I'm going to take Kirk Cousins over Blaine Gabbert. Though I do want to give Blaine Gabbert credit, you know, he was able to drive the team in the spots to win games against two above 500 teams in the Titans and in the Jags. And I think Blaine Gabbert has played decently enough over the last several weeks. You could argue definitely maybe against the AFC South in the competition, and sure, that helps. But to at least keep a roster spot on the Cardinals next year to either get the starting job for Arizona or compete for it uh, with whoever they draft. But it's just one of those things where Washington, you know, they lost to the, the, you know, the Cowboy game. That was a huge surprise. But the Charger one wasn't. Even DJ Swearinger after the game said, well, he didn't expect the team to win because they had a horrible week at practice. Um, but I look at this game. I'm just going to take the quarterback. I might regret not taking Arizona plus four and a half. I might do that. And I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, they won the game or covered. I just think, again, the Washington Redskins, they have too much talent. Hopefully they get Jordan Reed back. I, I think Kirk Cousins, if he wants to keep this contract, he has three winnable games coming up. He needs to play well and win these final three games to give the Redskins or to give himself a decent enough resume with all the circumstances that have gone around him uh, to pull the trigger and give him long-term money. If he loses this game, that guy needs to get out of Washington uh, faster than uh, some, of, you know, some of the politicians that are there right now. But, yeah, but that but that's the thing. If, if he loses this game against uh, Arizona, Kirk Cousins is not very good. I, you know, forget about all the numbers, and you can tell all the people that support him, you can tell me all the numbers you want. You know what, you know what I say to those numbers? Take that with the dad, as Dave Fisdell said. Basically, screw the numbers. I want results at this point, and Kirk Cousins is going to prove again that he's a loser. And he doesn't, he's not a franchise quarterback. And the only thing that I, I think that if he, like, if he loses this game, the only thing Kirk Cousins can be is a bridge gap quarterback for a team. Um, but we'll see. But <laughs> uh, but I'm going to take Washington minus four and a half because I will trust Cousins in this spot to be able to outplay uh, Blaine Gabbert and this Cardinal team who has its own injuries um, to pull up this one. And also it's a home game. If this game was in Arizona, I might have taken the Cardinals. But with being in Washington, I think uh, Washington will get revenge for last year and pull up the win. That's what I like Washington here, minus four and a half, and Washington straight up. Next game, the Rams over the Seahawks. This is a, this is a tough game uh, because both teams were in competitive games against playoff-worthy teams. Both of them lost by six to eight points, even though that, that the Eagles-Rams game, that really was a two-point game. The other six points were covered when Goff threw a backwards lateral interception to uh, Brandon Graham. But I'm taking the Rams here because... I trust this Rams offense and team. Like, the Seattle Seahawks were getting decimated by the Jags. Russell Wilson had three interceptions in the first, 
half or through the first three quarters. They only put up three points. The Jags defense, the Jags offense had huge gaping plays to Dede Westbrook. Uh, Ke- Keelan Cole had a 75-yard touchdown right after the Seahawks tied the game. And I think the Rams, with the offensive talent that they have, they can do the same thing. And remember, the Rams are motivated. The last time these two teams played each other in Week 5, it was the five-turnover game, and the Rams still had a chance, even with all those turnovers, to win the game if Cooper Cup catches that second down uh, seam route in the end zone. And then I don't think the Rams are going to turn it over five times, and because they're not playing the same Seattle defense. There's no Richard Sherman. There's no Cam Chancellor. There's no Cliff Averill. Bobby Wagner would now have a hamstring injury. He may not go. Um, K.J. Wright's in concussion protocol. So if you take out all these guys and add all these different pieces in, I, I, I don't think there's going to be enough for this uh, Seattle team on defense to survive. And even if the Rams do struggle offensively, I think the Rams' offensive firepower has enough uh, in them to, hold, uh, to put up enough points for the Rams' defense to shut down Russell Wilson. Because the Rams' defense has had a pretty good way of getting to Russell Wilson causing hits, sacks, and turnovers that I think if they don't turn it over as often, which I don't think they will, they'll be able to find a way to pull out this victory. It should be a great game. I'm really excited. And I'm taking the Rams here because I trust the offense and because of and the defensive injuries. If you told me, okay, K.J. Wright and Bobby Wagner are going through injuries, uh, Kayvon Webster, or... Uh, yeah, Kayvon Webster was, was tore his Achilles, and Tremaine Johnson's a concussion protocol. So, yeah. That cancels out. So it goes back to, I trust the Rams' offense and what the Rams' defense has left in it compared to what Seattle's offense has in it, which is Russell Wilson. And, uh, that's it. <laughs> Sounds like the LA Rams here, plus two, and the LA Rams straight up. The next game, uh, New England over Pittsburgh. This is a game where I'm going to trust the Patriots to bounce back. The game against Miami, that was probably the second worst game the Pats have looked uh, all all year since the opening game. Uh, They did not convert a third down for the first time uh, under the Brady-Belichick era. Brady also had his lowest total yards in a first quarter or first half. Yeah, in a first quarter ever for them in 282 starts for the Patriots. And even through all that, Brady had two picks. And in the last uh, two games, he's had one TD to three interceptions against both division teams. And even with all that, I just have to trust the Patriots that they're going to be motivated to against a much better Pittsburgh team who has been sliding by, as I've said earlier, with the you know four field goals, four game-winning field goals in the last five games. But they also gave up 38 points to the Ravens. They gave up 31 points to the uh you know, 28 points to the Packers. They gave up. They were down 17 to three at the half against the Bengals. I just feel like the Pats and Steelers are going to be in a close game. And I think the Pats have enough offensive firepower, um, some defensive help, and just the, the Steelers' defense about Shazier. I think Brady will outshoot Roethlisberger in this game, and also Brady gets a huge help by getting Rob Gronkowski back. That's significant for the Pats because of their offense, and he, it was a seven-point game, and I think Rob Gronkowski is arguably the second or third most valued non-quarterback in the NFL. If Gronk's there, they maybe the Pats win that game, even with all the uh, struggles the Patriots had. Would I be surprised if Pittsburgh won this game? No. Pittsburgh has shown, definitely over the last several weeks, they have the longest winning streak in the NFL right now at eight straight games. They're, they're able to play you know, decently defensively, and all the offense over the last few weeks with all the defensive injuries, they're able to turn it on instantly when they need to, and they have a more talented and loaded offensive roster than the Pats do at this point. But at the end of the day, I'm just going to trust Bill Belichick. I'm going to trust their Patriots to bounce back and do their jobs well enough to win this game and retake number one seed in the a- in the AFC. So that's why, I, that's why I like New England to pick them, and New England straight up. The next game, the Niners over the Titans. The Niners, <laughs> after starting out 0-9, they've won three of their last four. They're 3-1 and in their last four games. Who knew? The Niners can't even tank right. <laughs> but I'm taking the Niners here again because I can't trust the Titans. The Titans stink. They Mariota's had zero TDs and four interceptions in his last two games. 
they can't do anything offensively, which is sad. Mariota is a bum knee, and if Wayne Gabbard and the Cardinals can beat them, I think the Niners, with the talent they have, can do more. I'm going to put my faith in Jimmy Garoppolo again to win another football game. Um, would I be surprised the Titans won this game? No, but just after seeing what the Titans did, only putting up seven points against the Cardinals and having Blaine Gabbard be able to lead four field goals and win, and what I've seen the Niners do over the last couple weeks and you know beat the Giants pretty convincingly, have Jimmy Garoppolo at the end put up a touchdown in his first series as a Niner, have a, a game-winning field goal against the Bears, and they have a you know nice decisive win over the Texans. I'm going to put my favorite Garoppolo in this Niners team to come out once again and put up another decent game to win three straight <laughs> and uh, get to four and ten. Wow, how sad. And the sad thing is that they were in the AFC. They still might have a playoff shot. In the NFC, they were toast. But, um, but that's why, like, San Francisco, you're minus two, and San Francisco straight up. Uh, the final two games, the Cowboys over the Raiders. The Cowboys are playing for something. The Raiders are somewhat playing for something, but I, I like what Dallas has around them. Sean Lee, they're six and one with him, one and five without him. Um, and I just trust the Cowboys. I think they're, they'll be able to run the ball effectively. That Cowboy or that Raiders secondary is awful. Alex Smith and everybody, every quarterback has been able to torch them. And seeing how big Tyreek Hill was able to make plays, I think Des Bryant could have a great game. Jason Wynn will be able to run through the middle. And I, I think Rod and Alfred Morris will have another good game to get the Cowboys their third straight win and get to 8-6 uh, and six with two more games against uh, who they have left. They have Seattle and Philly. They could definitely compete in those games, definitely play well. But this is the Cowboy team that is on the right side of momentum while the Raiders are not. So that's why I like... Uh, Dallas here minus three, and Dallas straight up. And finally, Atlanta minus six over Tampa Bay. I have to trust Atlanta. Like, after getting the four and four, they've won. F uh, let's see. We're, I'm sorry. They were, I think, four and three, I guess. Yeah, for, for, yeah let me give you one second here. Look at the Atlanta Falcons record. Website here. Sorry, they were they were eight and five. Yeah, okay. After starting out four and four or getting to a point of four and four, they've won four of their last five games. Uh, the offense has looked uh, much more effective, and against the Bucks, I just don't have any faith in them. They've lost to the Lions. They've lost to uh, Minnesota pretty bad. They lost to Green Bay. They got blown up by the Saints. And the, the Bucks are just not good. And Jerry McCoy, is, Jerry McCoy now is a torn bicep. Uh, the Bucks don't really have a good home field advantage. And I just think, again, the Falcons have their talent rolling. They're, be, they're being able to score points. I mean, they're being able to play more solid, effective football. And I think that will be enough to propel the Falcons uh, to a uh, good win to improve the 9-5 and five and have give themselves still the opportunity to win out and win the NFC South. So that's why I like Atlanta minus six and Atlanta straight up. And that's it for my picks. So like, comment, rate, subscribe. Uh, shout out to uh, Andrew Warren, Stuart Madison, TJ Harmon, Geo Knows, Half Box Nation, uh, Half Moon's Picks, Bridgewater's Finest, and everybody in the NFL YouTube prognosticators page. Please check it out on Facebook. We have so many great uh, progs that do the stuff, that do what I do and make picks. And you, we all have a different style. We all have different approaches to it. And I encourage everybody that watches my videos, you know, new or old and new, to please check out them as well. Uh, because we are all great. We are a great community that enjoy the passion of predicting games and talking about everything that needs to know about the NFL. So, good luck to all players, coaches, teams, uh, fantasy players who are in their championship weeks. I know I am in two of my leagues in the other league. The NFL YouTube Prognosticators League. I am in the Constellation bracket playing my first game. So I, let's see how I do there. 
but I'm excited. So, but good luck to all fantasy players and fellow prognosticators. And until next week, this is Matthew the Fanatic signing off. Until then, so long.